for today's event uh, and session, we're going to be looking into game development. We'll first look into what is game development exactly. And we'll look at some pointers here and there and look at some stats and numbers from the industry. And then we'll look into uh, what you should do when you want to start game development exactly. The processes, the components, and everything in between. Finally, we'll have a case study of, on Flappy Bird. You know, a lot of you, I think, have already seen this game or played it, maybe. And if you didn't, you know, no problem. Today, we're going to look into it. Also, we're going to take a look at a ready-made Unity game for Flappy Bird, where I'm going to look over, like, some pointers here and there to show you how things are done. And then uh, we're going to open things for Q&A. So when looking at game development, before we even ask the question, what is game development, we need to know what is a game first. And a game, a video game is a, simply a piece of software that manipulates uh, images and sounds according to some form of input from the player that gets projected on a screen. A form of, of input that can be something like a controller, it could be a touch screen, it could be a mouse and keyboard, something like that. But notice that we have uh, you know, put a, an underline beneath screen. Back in the day, like 15 years ago, when we say a screen, everyone immediately thinks of a TV screen. But at this time, it couldn't be you know, uh, any far from that. It's actually, it could be a screen, a TV screen, it could be a computer screen, a laptop screen. It could be a mobile screen, so on your Android or iOS phone. It could be a tablet that you're playing with. It could be even a smartwatch. There are video games on smartwatches these days. And it could be a VR uh, headset because it contains a screen as well. So a VR, which is a virtual reality headset. So, you know, there's this big breadth of like uh, different games and different screens and platforms that we'll look into. But now that we understood what a game is, what is game development? And it's uh, the a domain that sparks out of the convergence of both logic and art. So when you put these two things to together, something like game development shows up. So that's as a concept, but as an industry, it's where passionate people gather together to create software with beautiful artistry and great world building that can be used to tell interactive and meaningful stories for people to experience. And so if you've seen like, um, you know, the amazing video games that have been created and you look at the creators, you usually find them to be passionate people in most cases. So when talking about the industry, just to look at some numbers, these are the numbers that we have from 2019. Uh, so back then, the um, the I think the chat started working. Amazing! Thank you so much, Sharon. So there is a uh, hundred and forty-five billion dollars in global revenue in twenty nineteen, with forty-five percent being focused on mobile. It is the fastest growing industry at the moment, and we can like looking at the revenue. It's already larger than uh, movies and the music industry. And of course, this is all backed up because we have 2.5 billion gamers, gamers in the world. So nearly like 30% of the population. So to back this up as well, let's look at some of the video games that are, you know, that have made a lot of success in this regard. So first of all, we have Grand, Th Grand Theft Auto 5, uh, which is made by Rockstar Games. It costs them $265 million to, uh, to make it and create it. And it, uh, the revenue became $6 billion uh, over like the course of the years that were, since the time it was published. It's already um, an all-time great, greatest uh, game when it gets to success. But that doesn't mean that it's only successful because of Rockstar Games, which is a game studio. We're looking at Undertale at the bottom, which is made by Toby Fox. This is a single game developer. He created nearly all the art, except for a few couple of things. And he also created all the game logic, the uh, the music that you're listening to, and he wrote the whole story. He It cost him $50,000 to create. And we're mentioning $50,000 because he's created already uh, a Kickstarter campaign. The amount of money that he was looking for was $5,000, but the community gave him 10 times that, that much in order to create it. And that, you know, all of that cost at the end gave him $26 million in revenue. So, okay, now we established what is a, you know, the, the video game, how is the industry going and all like all, all the things like that. But let's look into when you want to start uh, game development, what are the processes that you need to look into? And the first thing being the planning itself. You need to plan, you know, uh, the whole process. First of all, you look at the market, you analyze it. 
uh, and then you try to ideate what are the things that you need to add? What would the market need? You determine the target audience. Uh, so you pick some specific age group, for example, excuse me. And then you try to uh, target that audience by making ideas and trying to brainstorm a game that fits the, their needs. Of course, you will try to pick the platform according to popularity in that market. And then, of course, pick the technological specifications that will work well for you. For you, Once all that is done, you will create something called the GDD, which is the Game Design Document. And that is a document that contains the whole plan, the whole idea that you want to create. It contains the story, the characters, the levels, the specific points here and there that you need to add. The gameplay itself. Is it a multiplayer? Is it a single player? What is the interaction that's happening between the uh, the different characters in the game? All the NPCs, the non-playable characters. With that being said, you can think of the GDD as the roadmap for your game. It tells you where to start and where to end. But of course, as you move forward to the development and the work on things, you can, of course, go back and change this document. But in the beginning, it's going to really help you out, uh, plan your, uh, you know, the, the process as you move forward. Um, next. Oops, okay. So next we have production. And in this case, you have finished you know, planning everything and now you're ready to develop. First of all, you will begin by prototyping. You create a small version, maybe one or two levels of the game. And then you try to see how are things going in there? Is it playable? Does it make sense? You test with like a, a couple of people from the audience, from your target audience. Maybe you can show it to people like the investors if you're looking for investments. You will create uh, visual content that you can show. You will start designing the levels. You will start working with audio design and voiceover for your characters. And of course, you'll be doing lots of coding. Now that you're done with all of this, you will you finish the product. Everything's ready. Now you start working on the testing. You start with localization testing or user acceptance, test, acceptance testing. Uh, you check the performance and make sure that it's actually performing the way that you want it to be performed. And then you try to test things like load testing with things like multiplayer and things like that. Finally, you've done a lot of testing and you think now the game is done. It's ready to be launched. The time has come. You launch the game, but you find out there are a lot of bugs. And this happens with every single product, regardless of whether it's a video game or a software. What you need to do is to be ready for these kind of situations, to bug fix it immediately and fix all the issues that shows up. Of course, you will also be doing a lot of marketing as well. Now that you have finished with all of the launch stuff that comes with the first few weeks of launch, you have to care about the post-launch uh, phase, which is you try to release a lot of updates, okay? So things like DLCs, downloadable content, new content to keep the game fresh. And you check this stability and performance for the people that are using your game. Now that we understood the process itself, let's break things down for the game itself, what it contains exactly. What are the game development components in there? So first of all, we look into the uh, story itself. And so thinking about the story, looking into uh, the whole thing, like where does the, the, the game starts? Where does it end? Is there a backstory that we need to, to think about? All of these things help out in making a very, very immersive game. You look into the characters, you add some depth into their development and how everything is playing out in the general scheme of the game. And then you pick an art that actually works for you. Don't think of the art as only being a triple eight kind of like uh, 3D beautiful design. It could be something that is 2D pixel art top down, just like Undertale. It really performed so well, although this, the art style is not that you know complex and complicated. And finally, you look into the ga gameplay. It's a very important component of the game itself. How's the gameplay? Is it focused on multiplayer? Is it focused on single player? What is happening exactly? in there and you know you focus on things like is it an rpg so the genre as well is it an rpg is it a turn-based right and you focus on all of these things with uh paying attention to the target audience okay now we understood the components but how can we actually build those components and mainly we have these two lists there are of course uh, a lot more components out there so things like uh, for the game development to develop the game you have things called game engines which are pieces of software that helps you to bring everything together and in the end, come out with the products. We have Unreal Engine, which is a very, very powerful tool that uh, utilizes C++, 
to create everything. You have Godot, which is an open source free game engine using something called GD Script, something they created for their own game engine. You have Unity, which we will be visiting today, that uses a programming language called C Sharp. Okay, so all of these things are called game engines. And then you have the art design at the bottom. This is the tools. Uh, these are the tools that are used by game artists to create the characters, to create the scenery, to create the UI, the user interface. So you have something like Blender, which is a 3D tool that helps you create 3D um, elements. And then you have GIMP, which is free open source that lets you create things like pixel art, for example. And then you have 3D Max, which is more on the uh, professional side of things, more on the, um, you know, it's, it's quite costly to use, but it's very powerful as well. You can, of course, use things like Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, and anything like that. Now, what are the careers that you can follow in game development? You can be a game developer and a person who writes code to bring everything to life. You get, you take the arts from the artist, you take the sounds from the, uh, you know, the, the sound engineer, for example, and you work with everything just to make the game work in the, in the vision that you guys have been thinking of. You can be a game artist who takes the ideas and the story and everything, and you start creating amazing characters and amazing scenery that can be used in the game. You can be a sound engineer who's going to be working with composers, building the, uh, who are doing the, you know, the sounds for the game itself. Uh, who are doing, um, you know, like uh, original soundtracks. You can be the person who goes out and literally literally uh, record every single piece of sound that you hear in the game. And then you try to test things and make sure that everything is working as intended. You can be a level designer who's creating the level in the game, a writer who's writing the story, the dialogues for everyone. Or finally, and one of my favorites, a tester, someone who spends the whole day just play with the games, finding bugs, and communicate it and give it as a feedback to the team to work on. Now, okay, we understand the team, but what are the setbacks and challenges that we should be thinking of? And first and foremost, it's motivation. That's one of the key things that I've seen in any team that I've seen before or any person who went into this endeavor. You need to be motivated because it takes a lot of time and effort to create passion, you know, games that you're passionate about. So keep in mind that at the end, it you know the result is very rewarding. The resources, sometimes you simply don't have enough resources. So things like money or maybe uh, contacts from marketing and things like that. And so you might need to take that into consideration. Also time, game development can, you know, it could be quick or it take, could take a long time depending on the complexity and the idea of the game. So you need to take that into consideration. And finally, the team. You know, with all of that being said, you need to have a team that is as passionate as you are about the, uh, you know, your game. And this could be also applied to any kind of endeavor in life, but when it gets to game development, because you don't get to see the result of your, uh, or the fruit of your actions immediately. The players will not be able to play the game immediately. It will take time for the game to be done. And so your team should be as passionate as you. So try to pick people who are as passionate as the game as you are. Now we jump into the case study of Flappy Bird. So, you know, a lot of people have already played this game. And it's a game that took the world by storm a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a mobile game. It's a single tap game. You only tap the screen for the build to fly. And I'll show you an example of it today. It was created by someone called Dong Nguyen. He's a developer who created the game. He was not that famous or he didn't have a team or anything. He just took the game and allegedly he created the game in only three days. Uh, the revenue from this game is $18 million, according to the, uh, to the Verge. And according also to Dong himself, he used to make $50,000 every single day from ad revenue across the globe. Uh, he targeted the platforms for Android and iOS. Okay. And so let me stop sharing right now and try to show you guys the game as we built it. Okay. So first of all, I'll show you uh, the link that we're going to be sharing with you guys so you know how to use it. Okay, so this is the GitHub page that contains the, uh, the, uh, the game itself, the project. If you already have Git installed on your computer, you can use you know, any of these options. If you don't, you can go immediately to the download zip, click on it, and it's going to download the whole project for you. Okay. Um, next, we're going to look into 
the game engine itself. Okay, so this is the Unity game engine. And as you can see in here, it has a lot of things going on, a lot of windows. Um, first of all, we're gonna look into the project tab. It contains all the, you know, the elements that make up the project itself. So if I go here, you can go and navigate to the different folders in the project. If I go to assets, we have all the scripts in here. We're gonna look into them one by one. And the first time you boot up the project, you're gonna to go to scenes and go on the sample scene, which you see here on the right. So first of all, let me show you what the game looks like. So when I hit on play here on the top, I went to the game window, game tab, click on play, and then we start playing the game. Let's give it a minute. And you can see that it's working properly. So that's the whole idea. This is the kind of game that gave the person 50 grand every single day. It's simply a game that lets you just keep tapping, tapping on the screen to go, uh, you know, to navigate these obstacles that you're looking at. You hit on play again and people continue playing. The bird, you just need to make the bird go through the obstacles without hitting any of the obstacles, which are the pipes or the ground itself. Okay, so let's look into what makes this game. You have the background here, which when I click on it, it's gonna show me in the hierarchy section here on the right. We have the sample scene, which contains everything. And then we go inside, we have the main camera. You can see a preview of what the game looks like. We have the background here, which contains the, the background itself. Now, where does it come from? We go to assets and it comes from this image right here. This is an image in the game. And let me increase the size. It contains all of these elements inside one sprite sheet. All of these are called sprites. That's what they call the images in here. And the um, the a single element of these is called a sprite. To make them come out, as you can see here, they are have they have been divided here. We go to the right here in the inspector to sprite mode. We click on this button here and we go to multiple. In the beginning, you're going to see it as single, which is not what we want. So we go on multiple instead. Um, then we go on Sprite Editor, we click on it, and it's going to show us everything here. So all of these elements have been divided. And let me try to delete a couple of these to show you what it means. Okay. So now these are not elements. And what we can do is manually click on them and do it like this, which is not an ideal situation. Instead, we can go to Slice, keep it at Automatic, and then click on Slice. So now everything has been automatically sliced, but you need to go and check each and every one of those. So if I click on control and I zoom in, okay, you can see that get and ready are two different words and this is not what we want. So I'm gonna remove get and just increase the width of ready. So I click on it and go on the left and just increase the size. Same thing with game over. I'm gonna take this and increase the size. I'm gonna pull back just a bit to check everything, is it looking as good as I want? And you can see that everything has been divided. I pull back all the way, and then we have the apply button here. I click on it, and it gets applied. And then you can see all the results here, each and every single one of these. So if I go now to the background, you can see that if I click on the sprite, it shows me the background. But if it's not been set from the beginning, I can simply just click on uh, the image itself, drag it and drop it here on the sprite section, okay? Then we have the bird, the protagonist of this game, the superhero of this game. Um, its character is actually right here at the bottom. If I scroll, we can see it right here. And this is the, the character. This is the image, although you can see that it contains a couple of like flappy uh, states, different images for each flap state. If we go to the animator, and in the animation, and we click on the bird, you can see the different states. So this is the first state. We continue, now it's the second, now it's the third, now it's the fourth. To apply this, we actually go to projects. I'm gonna uh, you know, drag it and put it on the right. And then I'm gonna scroll all the way down. You can see that once I reach to it, I'm gonna be able to pick one of them, <laughs> and then drag it and drop it all the way here. So that's the situation. 
This way we can click on play and it's gonna give us this flappy kind of animation, okay? Now that we have the bird, we can go to the ground. The ground has been you know, extended all the way to the right. The sprite has been selected and then in the draw mode, and instead of having it usually as simple, you can see that it's looking quite stretched. We don't want to see that. Instead, we change it to tiled so that it looks tiled. Then I'm, I'm going to look over the, uh, the components later on, but now I'm just going to continue with the different objects in the game. Now we go to the game object called Obstacles Generator. This is uh, a kind of game object that's going to create the obstacles for me. We're going to look into the code and see each and every bit of it as you move forward. Event system is something that is default, so we're going to leave it in there. The game manager is the uh, piece of empty game object that gets created by right clicking on an empty space. You go to the bottom and you click on create empty, which is going to create this for you. And then you can call it game manager, for example. I'm just going to remove it because we already have a game manager object. And that's, I think, another one that I created. Let me remove it. Then we have this core canvas. If we scroll all the way back, you can see that it's the one that looks like this at the top with the zero. So if I open it and look at text, this is the text that we have, okay? And it's gonna show us all the different uh, you know, scores that we accumulate throughout the game. So let me go back to the bird. Now that's a holistic like look into the game objects. But if we look into the bird itself, it contains multiple things in here. So these are called game uh, components. For example, the first game component is rigid body 2D. This gives it the ability to have phys uh, you know, physics in the game. To add one, you go to add component and then click on rigid body, type it, and then you, uh, you choose rigid body 2D. Then it's gonna show up here. So this gives you things like mass, it gives you gravity, and we'll keep everything as it is. Uh, I'm going to look later into scripts to show you everything, but let's jump over to the capsule collider 2D. This gives the object the ability to have a boundary around it that gives you, you know, it, when it hits something, it shows up for you, actually. So when we click on uh, this button here to edit the collider, you can see that we can increase the height or the width of the capsule. This means that's gonna be surrounding the whole bird. Whenever it hits another collider, you will be able to know through the script, scripts that we write. Okay. Now we have this other canvas here. So it's actually hidden. And to show it, there's this checkbox in the inspector in the top right. We click on it, that's gonna show up for us. So we double click on it and we pull back. So this is the game over screen that shows up when it's actually hidden because we only show it up whenever the user has, you know, uh, the player hits an obstacle. So it's, uh, it's you know, always, uh, you know, inactive and hidden. So let me go back to the bird. Now, what makes the game work? What makes the bird fly up and down and jump around and everything? This is something called a game script, and it's a piece of code that you add to anything that you want to add, uh, you know, conditions, functionality, buttons, things like that. You can go to add components, and then when as you type things, if it's not part of whatever you have here, you can make a new script, okay? So we can go and create, uh, for example, birds fly, and it's, you know, and it's gonna show up here, right? It's not gonna show up in the bottom, but when we create a new script, it's gonna show up and a new file will be created for us. We already have a script here, so we'll jump into a tool called VS Code, which stands for Visual Studio Code, and it's a piece of software that lets us write the code for us. So we go to Bird Behavior, I double clicked on it, and now it shows up right here. So this is the Bird Behavior. This is what, uh, you know, the pieces of code that govern the logic for the uh, for the bird itself, how it flies, how it goes up and down, and everything like that. So you can see here in the, in the beginning, we have, uh, these are comments that I've added. So that once, you know, you, know, you, you take the code itself, you need, you know, download the project, you can go in there and read how the scripts were written and why they were like that. This public game manager is actually um, a reference, a mention of the game manager here. 
we're look we're gonna look later into what does that mean, how we can pull it, and how we can use it. We go down, and we have the speed. It's uh, it, this is something called a variable, and a variable is something that is simply just uh, you know a space in the memory that you know saves data for us. So we keep the number one here, but we can always change it from the Unity window. I now will show you later. Then we have the rigid body. Remember that we created a game object called or game component called rigid body that gives the you know any game object that we give it to it gives them physics and you know physical interactions. So things like gravity and mass we can give it to that. This is called a function, and a function is a piece of soft, a piece of code that every time you know you can call it and use it in anywhere you want. In the case of Unity and in the case of you know uh, scripts in Unity. The starts function is a function that is you know that is executed in the first time the uh, the, uh, the game starts. So uh, you know immediately from the name, you can get the idea that the minute you start the game, you can go immediately, and this gets executed. What we said here is that RB that we created right here is the component inside this game object right for the bird that is of the type rigid body, and then we go to the update function. And in the update function, it's a, again another function just like start, but there's something special about this one. It gets executed every single frame. And notice I said frame and not um, you know um, second because it, it doesn't get executed every second because one second can equal to, for example, twenty frames, sixty frames, a hundred frames, according to you know the these, you know the the game itself. And the pieces of code here that we've written is an if statement that says, if we click on the mouse button that is number zero, so we, there are zero and one, and zero here is the left mouse button, and one is the right mouse, bu mouse button. So it's gonna go immediately to the velocity, right? Because again, it's physics, and it's gonna give it a direction of up, so it's upward, and then it's gonna multiply it by the velocity that we have written here. So in this case, inside the file, it's one, but you can see that in Unity, I'll go, I'm gonna show you, it's four. And that's what makes Unity beautiful, uh, because you can write code here and change, you know, some values over in the inspector window. But make sure that you have public written in here. Um, after we do this, it's just gonna make it go up and down. So if I go and comment this piece of code, so as if I hit it when I go back. So if I hit play, Give it a minute to reload all the scripts. So I will click on play now, and you can see that the the upwards and downwards movement that it used to have doesn't exist anymore. So that's how effective game script code can become. So I'm going to stop it, and I'm going to go back, explain uh, what this piece of code does, and re-enable it. So this is an Euler of angles, and it's uh, you know uh, it's a thing about mathematics. I'm not going to go to the math mathematical aspect of this. The idea here is that you create a new vector which has three dimensions x, y, and z. Okay, and then we change uh, the final one with the velocity direction, and then we give it some you know we multiply it by some value to give it the feeling of going up and down slowly. Finally, we have this function that is called in collision enter 2D. Remember that we created a capsule collision 2D, right? So in there, we, you know, it, it gives us the ability, like I said, to uh, trigger this function whenever a collision happened between two components that both have a collision. Collision could be a box collision or a capsule collision, and they can both interact with each other. If one object has a collision, but the other doesn't have a collision component, and it hits it, nothing is going to happen because it doesn't, it doesn't trigger anything. So both components. Both game objects need to have the same thing. But in this case, it takes the game manager and it runs the game over uh, function. Where does the game over exist? We can go here to the game manager and you can see it right here. So first of all, when the game first begins, because this is the game manager, we set the time scale to one. And the time scale is actually the, um, you know, the speed at which the game is working. One is the normal number that we always have. If you want you know, to add an effect of slow motion, for example, you might reduce this by like 0 0.5. So that means that the game is experienced at half the speed. Okay, and then we have the game over function that we had before, excuse me. 
So in the game over function, this is a function that's going to show up when the game stops. And it gives you, it's changed the state of the game over canvas right here. And we're going to see later on how that is added. We're going to change it to active, right? Because uh, if we go back to Unity, let it reload the scripts. So this is the canvas that we were talking about. It was set to unactive. This was false, which means that it's not active. And then in the game manager, we have the canvas right here. How do we add it? We simply drag it and drop it here. And then this game over canvas, which we've added right here, can immediately access that component and change its active state from true to false and likewise. We set the time scale to zero because we want to stop the game when the game over happens. And then finally, we have the replay function, which lets us load the scene again. And this load scene means that we repeat the same you know, level that we had. And in this game, we only have one scene, which can be found in the scenes folder. Afterwards, we have, uh, first of all, the obstacles generator. This is a little bit of a lengthier uh, you know, piece of code, piece of script. It gives us the ability to create obstacles one after the another. Now, where are the obstacles saved exactly? When we go back to Unity, we go to Assets, right? In the Project tab, we go to Assets. Uh, let me move it here so it can be on a bigger scale. And you can see it right here. This is called a prefab, and you can see the name right here. A prefab is a piece of game object that can be reused multiple times. If I click on it, like double clicks, you can see that it's made up of these three separate game objects. The first one being the top obstacle. If I click on it here, you're going to see it right here, a game obstacle. If I go to the bottom obstacle, this, it's going to be this one. So these are opposites of each other. And you can see that there is the transform component with the position being set to positive or negative. And so if I change the bottom, for example, from negative to positive, it's going to take it upwards. Okay, But we're going to keep it as negative to keep it downwards instead. Both of these have what we call a box collider 2D. We add it by going again to component, typing box, box collider 2D, and then changing the collider itself. If I zoom in, I can increase and decrease it as I please. Okay. And the same thing can be done to the bottom obstacle instead. If I go to space, it's the same thing, a box collider, but it has one single change. It has the collider here, and we set it to the space, but we do it as a trigger. The difference being that if it's not a trigger, it's going to stop the game, you know, the, the bird from flying through. We want it to fly through, but we want to be able to trigger a function once that happens. So this is where the trigger comes in. Now, if I go back, the obstacle generator that we were just looking at, um, it takes an object of obstacle that we drag from the prefab and we put it here. And there is um, a variable called max time. This is gonna be the maximum time that is needed before we create a new obstacle. This is a timer that gets increased and then it gets compared to max time. And then finally, the height that's gonna play between up and down so that we can play with uh, you know, the game itself and where the, the instantiated, where, is, where the new game obstacle shows up. For that to be created, you can see that anything with the word public actually shows up here in Unity. So max time shows up there, and it's equal to two, just like we have. The obstacle here is the same thing that we just looked at with the pipes and everything in between. When we go to the start uh, function, it takes the new obstacle. It instantiates it. This is a function that is built into Unity, which means that, hey, take this obstacle with the pipes and create a new one for me. So it's going to keep creating ones for them, right? But because we have it in the start function, this is only going to happen once, the first time the game starts. And then we go to new obstacle, the transform.position, which means that this is encoding. We go and choose the properties one by one. And then we choose, uh, we go and take the current uh, position and we change it by a random range between the height that we mentioned here, minus and positive. So in the range between the negative number and the positive number. In case you didn't notice, I have called. This is why my voice is stirred. Um, and then after 10 seconds, we destroy this. This is important so that 
it doesn't, we ju don't just keep generating a pipe after another, an obstacle after another, which is gonna be very difficult for the memory to maintain for a long, a long time. So after 10 seconds, destroy the object once it left the screen. We do the same thing, but right here in the update uh, section, well, you know, for that for it to be checked every single frame, we go and check if the timer is greater than the max time, you know, the timer is zero. Now, when is it gonna be increased? At the bottom here. So we use the time dot delta, delta time, which is the time between every single frame. And it just keeps adding it a little bit by a little bit until it's, it gets above two seconds. And max time being two seconds, means that only execute this piece of code if the current timer is greater than the max time. And then just the minute that happens, just rerun everything you see here, all of it. Just rerun it again. Now, okay, we have created the pipes, but what happens to the pipes themselves? How do they move forward? And this is where we're going to go to the pipe behavior uh, script. In the start, we have nothing here, but in the update, we just simply tell it that every single frame just keep increasing it steadily to the left direction, multiplied by this speed and when the time changes. If this is not making sense, it's okay. As you try to play with things, you're gonna see how it looks like and you're gonna be able to see how things play into each other. Now, finally, we have the past pipe. Remember the one in the middle right here. So when I go to obstacle, you can see the past pipe here, the script. And inside of it, we have a box collider with a trigger. So we're gonna go back to the code. Whenever a trigger happens, remember that we said is trigger and we set it to yes. Go to the score manager and then change it to like increase the score by one. So plus plus, which means increase it by one. So we go now to the score manager, which is this class here. And we have something called a static, <clears throat> sorry, a static integer. Which is a variable that keeps saved, like you know, gets saved into the memory itself, and it doesn't change unless you change it. In the beginning of the game, it gets set to zero, and then in the updates, you go and get the component for the UI text, and we're gonna see where that comes from. We go back to Unity, we go to the score canvas, if you remember, and then we go down. There is a text component in there. To add a text, we right-click on the uh, on, on this game object. We go down to UI and then we choose text at the bottom. This canvas comes from right clicking here, going to UI and then choosing canvas. So we can create score canvas. And inside of it, we can go to UI again and choosing text, which is gonna give us an exact replica of what we have above. Inside this text, there is the score manager script. It acts as, uh, you know, it acts as this text uh, component and then it changes the value in there. To show you an example of what that means, I'm gonna go and type in store. This is called a string in programming, and it contains uh, you know, text values. So now if I save it and go back, it's going to update things, reload all the scripts and prepare them so that when we play the game, it's gonna show us the word score with zero in front of it. So now if we keep continuing this, it keeps increasing the value. Remember that score comes from the script that we just written in VS Code and then game over. So let's go back. Okay, now with all of that, the behavior and the score manager and the past pipes and everything, where do the, all these things go? This in the obstacle generator, this is where we looked at. We added the obstacle script here. In the score canvas, this is where the score manager comes. In the game manager, this is where the game manager goes into. And it's again, if you remember, it just looks into the game. If we have an obstacle that happens, it runs a piece of function called game over that turns this on and that stops the game completely. And inside of it, you can see that everything is hidden, but let me reactivate it. This play button, inside the canvas to, uh, to use it, we go to UI and then we have a button here, we click on it and then this is gonna show up. For the image to be changed, we can, like I said before, we can immediately just drag this and drop it here. For the function to be running, we can 
add these event listeners. This is what they call. So simply what we're saying is that when a click happens, just run this game manager, which comes from here, and we drag it here. So then we choose replay. And again, finally, this is the final result. Game manager is, uh, sorry, the game over canvas is there because I didn't deactivate it. But once I go back and deactivate it, it's going to be hidden, and then the game will be functionally working.